and cold. They're, 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 you never clean that up. I think my, my personal view is that if we turn to all the other hydrocarbons, coal included, and use them as substitutes for oil. Coal, after all, can be liquefied and used as a, uh, the source of a fuel for, uh, for, for transportation. If we do that, uh, th there will, of course, be severe economic dislocations. because we'll, we'll be doing it because the price has gone so high that we have to do it. And if the price goes that high, not only will gasoline cost more at the pump, but all, all the chemicals that are made from petrochemicals, uh, for, from petroleum, uh, will cost more, and everything that has to be transported will cost more, and so there will be inflation, and, and no doubt more serious disruptions like wars and, and, uh, and so on. But if we do it, if we must so somehow sort of muddle through by using all the other hydrocarbons we can get our hands on, and if that doesn't destroy the climate of the planet, make it un uninhabitable, I think we will have the Hubbard's peak for coal, and hub the Hubbard's peak idea works just as well for coal as it does for oil, we'll have the Hubbard's peak for, for coal, I think, within this century. Uh, and and, and then civilization itself will not survive uh, unless we find a way to live without fossil fuel. Now, the physics of uh, how to live without fossil, f fossil fuel is very straightforward. There are only two other possible sources. There's sunlight and there's nuclear energy. A and so we would have to devise a way of running our civilization on those two sources. If you use the kind of nuclear energy that's conventionally used in the United States today, which is a fission uh, of uranium-235 only. Uh, the biggest plants that you can build are about a gigawatt. If you wanted to build enough to replace all the fossil fuel that we burn worldwide today, which is uh, 10 terawatts, you would have to build 10,000, 10,000 of the biggest possible nuclear plants. And if you did that uh, and burn U-235 in them, the worldwide reserves of uranium would be exhausted in somewhere between one and two decades. So it, w it would be a, a bridge at best. Um, th th there are other solutions. You can build uh, breeder reactors, and then you have much, much more energy available. But breeder reactors make plutonium. Plutonium is very dangerous, and this is a dangerous world. Making the world safe for, uh, for breeder reactors is, is a very tall order. Uh, there has always been the hope that we would conquer the problem of nuclear fusion, ther thermonuclear fusion. Uh, that promise has been 25 years away for the past 50 years, and it's still 25 years away. It's an extremely difficult um, technical problem to solve. Uh, but if ultimately we were to solve it, and we would be, would be able to, to burn just uh, deuterium from seawater, then every gallon of seawater would contain as much energy as 300 gallons of gasoline. So for the long-term future, that's our best hope. Uh, sunlight, we already use a great deal of sunlight in the form of uh, hydroelectric power. Hydroelectric uh, power is a, a form of solar energy. Uh, about 25% of the world's electrical energy is generated that way, but we can't build more dams. We've already dammed up every year we can. We can't, we can't replace the missing oil with, with hydroelectric. Wind energy is becoming more, uh, uh, more popular uh, and ec economically viable, but because of its intermittency and low power density, uh, it will n never contribute more than a small fraction of our uh, energy supply. People talk about biomass, which means you grow something and burn it. Uh, that's the way the human race lived exclusively until 200 years ago. Uh, and of course, it always is possible to do that. Uh, the principal uh, uh, drawback to biomass is that it's generally pretty inefficient. That is to say, only one or two tenths of one percent of the sunlight that falls on the land winds up as chemical energy to be used. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and of course, you have to worry about using any uh, substantial fraction of the world's arable land to grow fuel instead of food. That's a, that, that's a bitter trade-off. Uh, the gold standard for, for, for solar energy is photovoltaics, that is solar cells. To generate the, the same amount of power we now use in fossil fuels worldwide, you'd have to cover a uh, land area roughly half the size of the state of California with, uh, with, with photovoltaics. Uh, that's not such a tremendous area because there are large parts of the world where land is unused and could be used for this. Uh, but all of the um, uh, solar cells made in the world up to now probably would only cover about 10 square kilometers. It's a tiny fraction of it. So uh, making uh, that tremendous amount is, is really a, a, a fearsome technological challenge. Not impossible, not unthinkable, but really a huge technological challenge. In general, in general, you can make uh, more efficient solar cells, but they're more expensive. Or you can make cheaper solar cells, but they're less efficient. Uh, and so you, you've got to play the trade off. And, and people will get better at doing these things, and the efficiency will go up. But it, it, it can't go up by more than a factor of two or three uh, from what it is now. So the orders of magnitude of what I told you before will remain true. You don't have to cover all that land with photovoltaics. You can cover it with mirrors and use it as collectors and uh, all kinds of tricks you can use. And we have to figure out how to use those tricks. 
The important point is that the total amount of sunlight that falls on the planet is 20,000 times the amount of oil uh, of fossil fuel power we're using now. So we are awash in sunlight. There's plenty of energy from sunlight. We just haven't begun to learn how to use it properly. In the history of any natural resource, the supply starts at zero. It increases rapidly at first, and then as it becomes harder and harder to find new sources, it slows down, and eventually it reaches a maximum where you're depleting the resource uh, as fast as you can develop new, new sources of it. After that, it declines forever. So the, the history of, of the supply will resemble a bell-shaped curve. Um, the, the, the peak, the maximum, doesn't come at the end. It comes somewhere near the middle. Uh, and that's when the crisis will occur, because that's when the supply will start decreasing while the demand is still increasing. Uh, worldwide demand now is somewhere between 25 and 30 billion barrels a year, and it's increasing at a, an alarming rate. Uh, and that's really where the problem is. The, the demand is so huge, there is nothing that we can uh, uh, imagine uh, to replace oil, uh, oil in, in those quantities. Right now, we don't have the kind of political leadership. I don't mean only we in the United States. I mean the whole world doesn't have the kind of political leadership that would make us uh, aware of this problem and, and do something about it. Uh, but we could, if we had courageous, visionary leadership, we, we could realize that by burning all this fossil fuel, this, including the 25 billion barrels of oil each year, we are endangering the future habitability of the planet in ways that we can't predict. Uh, and, and at the same time, we are making ourselves dependent on some extremely unstable regimes in some very nasty parts of the world. Uh, and those are all good reasons, really solid reasons, for wanting to, to kick the fossil fuel habit. I think, for example, that if a president of the United States, as, as JFK said in 1960, we will put a man on the moon in this decade, and we did. It was an enormous technical problem, a challenge to do that, but we did it. If a president of the United States said, I challenge our scientists and engineers uh, to teach us how to kick the fossil fuel habit in a decade, I think it could be done. Whether that will happen by 2030 or not, I don't know. If it doesn't happen by 2030, I think this will be a very ugly world by then. Uh, the people who, who, who believe that this problem is not real uh, and have arguments about why it's not real, all future exploration is going to discover much more oil, even though the worldwide Hubbard's peak for oil discovery occurred around 1960, and it's been, uh, the, the supply has been declining, the rate of discovery has been declining ever since. They say, oh no, we're still going to discover plenty more. And the reason it's been declining is because we, we had so much oil that we didn't need any more, and people stopped looking for it, and, and they have all kinds of arguments. They tend to be intelligent, well-educated, uh, thoughtful people. Uh, I think they're well-intentioned people, but they have a conflict of interest being because most of them, almost all of them, uh, are in the oil industry, uh, and so they have a conflict of interest in, in, in evaluating this problem. Uh, the, the only thing I bring to the table that's any different is that I have no conflict of interest. I have no interest one way or another in, in, in whether you believe this. If you were able to to, to, to trigger the reaction in which you burn only deuterium, which is a, 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 an isotope of hydrogen, which is found naturally in seawater in small concentrations, but still all seawater holds it, uh, the amount of energy available in the deuterium in seawater would make uh, every gallon of seawater has as much energy as 300 gallons of gasoline. There are in the world two power plants that run on tidal energy, on tides. One is in France and the other is in Nova Scotia. Uh, and they work, but they're, they're, they're relatively small players. And there are very few places on Earth where the tides are high enough to make a difference. People talk about using the energy of the waves. Uh, I think that's what you were really referring to. But, but nobody's ever demonstrated successfully that you can do that on a large scale. Uh, there are lots of ideas around. Uh, and uh, uh, the ideas are just vapor until somebody actually tries them and shows that they either work or, uh, and have side effects or don't have side effects or don't work or whatever. That's called research. And that's exactly what we're not doing, is the research that would be necessary to, to make use of all these ideas. There are 6.4 billion people, I think, living on the planet now. Uh, most of them are reasonably well fed. And that's a consequence of what, what was called the Green Revolution in the second half of the 20th century. The Green Revolution consists in a very large measure of fertilizing land with petrochemicals, that is uh, fertilizers that are derived from, uh, from petroleum. I don't think that we could sustain the present population of the globe, much less what it will be in 20 or 30 years, uh, without the use of petrochemicals. So yes, we eat, we, we eat oil. <laughs>